Next up, we have from Australia, Dr. Owen White, a sensory misperception. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, it's now about um, 5 a.m. <laughs> so um, I hope you're all awake for that and, and up for it. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank everybody for being here, as has been said before. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's exciting to be involved with uh, the beginning of something. I think it's also important that all of us recognise that none of this would happen without Sierra and Paul Dom. Now, there are various things that we're going to talk about. And um, the reality is that most of you here, or many of you here, have uh, what for some is an affliction, for some is discomfort, for what is a problem. You are not alone. I have an affliction. I suffer from being a doctor. <laughs> okay? And you may think that's funny, but the reality is, as you heard today, you have a cognitive disorder. I have an acquired cognitive disorder. I have taught to be rigid in my thought processes, to not go beyond, to not think of uh, advances or new things or to consider anything that's uh, difficult. And we'll approach that. So what I'm going to try and explain to you today is some of the difficulties that I and the medical profession have in dealing with problems like this. Now, I'm also going to discuss the fact that neurology cannot be approached without understanding ophthalmology or vision. Uh, and let me point out that vision is not ophthalmology. Ophthalmology, with all due respect to my ophthalmic colleagues, by the way, I'm a neurological neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, but have a fair training in ophthalmology, and I have acquired the contempt that all subspecialties have for all other subspecialties. <laughs> Uh, but it is not too much to say that without an extensive knowledge of ophthalmology, a methodological investigation of diseases of the nervous system is not merely difficult, but impossible. Now, to, to, ex to extend that thought, you have to understand that 48% of all nerve cells that enter and leave the nervous system, that's including the cranial nerves and all those nerves that enter and leave the spinal cord, 48% of them are related to vision and control of eye movements. Leaves with the impression this might be a fairly dominant system in our existence. 53% of cerebral networks, Joe was a little imprecise earlier on today, um, and I thought I'd taught her better, but, you know. But 53% of cerebral networks are related to vision and control of eye movements. That doesn't mean they don't do other things as well, but this is a network system that is the first to develop in humans and other mammals, and is probably the template for the development of most other systems. Now, let's talk about disease or disorders. Diseases are not necessarily structural problems, they're function problems. They're loss or impairment of function and it's recognised as accumulated impairment of function, and this might be sort of immediate, or indeed might be over a period of time. Structural change may not necessarily be demonstrably proportional to functional impairment. Now, let's go back to the problems that I have from being a doctor, and we had part of this discussion today, and given that I have a more Gallic background than perhaps an Anglophile background, as some of my colleagues have. I go back to the French physicians who designed a neurological examination in the 1800s, okay? And fundamentally, it hasn't changed, okay? Uh, well, why should it? The brain hasn't changed in that time, so why change the examination? Uh, the reality is that at that time, these people, Charcot, uh, Parkinson, Babinski, uh, Sherrington in, in, in the UK in the early 1900s, recognised that the brain does things. And they observed these abnormalities of function at that time. And not to put too fine a point on it, 
The only alternative investigation was a post-mortem, and very few people actually signed consent forms for post-mortems in those days, which perhaps was a little ungenerous on their part, and it didn't help us very much. Uh, but they did not have access to what we had. Now, we subsequently, about 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, started to expand our horizons into functional and structural assessment. And we got taken up with the, the, the magic of modern technology. It's like, you know, eating a cake. You know, that crusty bit on the outside is the leading edge of technology. But there's a lot of goodness in the middle of the cake. And if you hang around, the middle of the cake is left over. So that's pretty much where we are today. Now, let's go back to a little bit of personal experience in modern neurology. I had a classical training. Many of my colleagues of my age had classical training. The people who are being trained today are getting the same training. A bit of a worry, actually. But uh, largely, we were taught not to question, while at the same time, we were taught question everything, OK? But the minute you questioned it, um, people were not impressed with your attitude. That was a bad attitude. Ignorance was bliss and remains bliss. Unfortunately, patients are disruptive. They get in the way of a good life. They keep telling you things that you haven't thought about and that you don't want to think about and you're not going to think about and you just want them to leave the room so that you can get back to treating simple things. Uh, they're a serious impediment to happiness. <laughs> so my personal experience is, what did I learn in medical school? school? If it doesn't move, it's sick. If it doesn't move well, it might be sick. If it doesn't feel, it's sick. If it doesn't feel really well, well, maybe sick. Anything else is clearly psychological and to be dismissed from organic medicine. Makes it easy. You know, it's nice to have rules and structure. It really helps. So, subsequently, this has been classified as the neurological examination by a blind man uh, examining an elephant. You know, depending on which part of the elephant you're holding on to, essentially, you'll have a different impression. If you're holding on to a leg, you might think it's a tree trunk. If you're holding on to a tail, you might think it's a snake. You're holding on to the trunk, God knows what that is. Um, but the trouble is, it gives you a very superficial impression of an elephant, a complex creature. And there's quite a lot of elephant inside that elephant. So, along comes the old Donald. You know, a lot of Donald's been around in time. But Donald Hebb came along in the 70s and introduced the concept of neuropsychology, okay? That the fact is, there were functional processes that took information and interpreted it and produced responses. And the sort of things that uh, Joe has been trying to educate me in for the last 17 years, unsuccessfully, I might add, mm -hmm. because I think ignorance is bliss. So neuropsychology was really born back in the 70s. And surprisingly, Melbourne, that little backwater city in the southern hemisphere close to Antarctica and complete with penguins, is one of the homes of neuropsychology. So, we move on and we come to how we can actually think about function. And it's a troubling area. And some of the functional deficits that we see, are some of them you suffer from, some of them are related. Visual snow, persistent perceptual postural disturbances, dizziness, tinnitus, disturbances of smell, disturbances of taste that go with disturbances of smell, and persistent migratory prickling. These actually cause people quite a lot of distress. But as we've already seen, half the brain's involved in vision. So this is a dominant symptom, and that's why you're here today. May well be a template for looking at some of these other sensory disturbances as well. Now, as I said, let's go through some of the principles of vision. You've heard about the 48%, you've heard about the 53%. But let's just think for a minute. You've got 100 million photoreceptors in each eye, OK? And in the occipital cortex, you've got 140 million receptors on each side. But you've only got 1 million cells in each optic nerve connecting those two areas from the front to the back. 
So what does that mean? It means you're not seeing me now. Or you may wish you're not seeing me now. But the reality is you are not seeing me now. You saw me a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago, and you remembered me. And all you're doing at the moment with your optic nerve is updating that system. Okay? So your vision, your perception of the world, is in fact a perception within the brain. It's not actually stream of consciousness. Things can go wrong with perceptions. So let's go back to the work by Meshulam, who said that a major task of the CNS is to configure the way in which sensory information becomes linked to adaptive responses and meaningful experiences. So in the visual sense, this means what we see helps determine what we might do. And the neural systems that bridge the gap between sensation and action provide the substrate for intermediary or integrative processing. The behavioral outcome of intermediary processing is cognition. So to paraphrase that, cognitive processing of visual information helps determine what we actually do. Okay, but remember, this is a percept. It's not constantly streaming in. It's constantly updating. Now, so what we remember, what we see is remembered data accumulated over time in one environment. It might be persistent over a period of time depending on the capacity of working memory to load data in and out. Maybe that's what palynopsia is. The information transmitted along the optic nerves refreshes the visual percept. More than visual information projects the visual cortex. And that's what people forget. There are more inputs to visual cortex than visual stimulation. There are auditory inputs. There are vestibular inputs. And there are, at least to pulvinar and thalamus, somatos somatosensory inputs that then probably project in some way, shape, or form to visual cortex. What happens in visual cortex, which is considered to be unimodal cortex, is not that it gets one input, but it only has one response, a visual response. And you have to be able to screen those extraneous stimuli out, okay? The inter interpretation of vision is dependent on complex network interactions that perform those screening processes. And visual snow, at least in part, um, represents the breakdown of filtering or otherwise hyperexcitability of cortex. Now, this is the system we're actually looking at, okay? This is a network, clearly a hell of a lot. Okay? And then what happens is that we can break that down into networks that are interactive at nodal points. Okay? So there's quite a lot going on there structurally. And the best way of examining a network, and this is a simple network, the London Underground, is to examine input and output. Okay? So if you think of it in terms of a train system, okay, you count the number of people get on, how long it takes them to get to their destination, or whether they get there at all or are diverted somewhere else, okay? Or whether they actually have to take a circuitous route to get to where they're going. So that's the, the sort of structure that we're actually looking at in a far more simplified uh, method than, than we would normally use, okay? Now, the principles of measurement of network function in the visual and ocular motor system are to control the input, and we know that there's an expected output because we know what normal people will do, and we know that those outputs are actually very stereotyped. We measure the input, we measure the output. We measure the amount of output, we measure the latency, this, the staggering of output, temporal delay, inhibitory function. Okay? Joe has gone through that before. Now, visual snow is most commonly defined as a sensory processing disorder. Understanding might provide some insight into the way the brain works. Defined measurable pr parameters will enable more accurate recognition of the syndrome. Okay? Measurable parameters may permit the evaluation of new therapies because it's very hard to measure the subjective responses of patients and know what's going on. You have to look at very large numbers of patients. It becomes very clumsy, and the process has become very expensive. So currently, you all know the symptoms. People have discussed these earlier. 
You all know the associations. The causation is uncertain and is probably more than one cause, okay? Uh, if we're talking about a network, if something goes wrong anywhere in the network, the whole network is dysfunctional. You don't know necessarily which part of the network that is. Uh, the investigations that we do these days are listed there as MRI, EEG, visual electrophysiology, OCT, visual fields, neuropsychological evaluation. I love them. We make money out of them. You know, fabulous stuff. The fact is that it really doesn't do very much clinically, but these things probably need to be done in the experimental situation to rule out uh, that we're dealing with other systems. Okay? But whether they should be done in the clinical situation where patients are not participating in research projects is is dubious. Um, now, the question is, is there therapy at the moment? Well, there is, but it's not effective. Uh, there are various things that have been trialled and there are various things that work in various people. And I'm talking not so much about the sort of things that, that Matthew has talked about because I think those are the most effective forms of therapy. I'm talking about what most doctors talk about as therapy, medications, uh, um, other sorts of therapy. But I think that part of the answer is learning to cope with what, in some people, is not a disorder, but is a variation of normal function. Let's not forget, the brain works on the principle of sloppy workmanship. Near enough is good enough. Could be Australian. The fact is that <laughs> the reality is that we have lots of redundant pathways that help all the time. So we may do it differently but we can still do it. And it's important to remember that. So the future, well, better understanding certainly helps all of us. Quantification of the disorder will help. Trials of therapy will help. So in reality, there is a bright future, but the future is an uncertain amount of time. The reality is that the accumulation of knowledge is expanding exponentially, and I don't know how long it will take to have a better understanding of this. I don't know how long it will take to develop effective therapies for a significant number of people, but I'm optimistic. Anyway, having said that, this is where I come from. It's not that far from where Jo was uh, showing her picture. It's easy enough to get there for a weekend. Uh, and it's very peaceful. I don't think you have visual snow down there, Matthew. Uh, it'd be very peaceful. And I think it's also quite pretty at uh, night and morning. So the question is, is this the dawn of a new day from the point of view of visual snow, or is this the sunset on ignorance? Let's hope it's both. Okay, thank you very much.